Okay, this morning, I want to talk to you about something the Lord put on my heart. And uh, the, 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 uh, the, the premise is this. What you see is not always what you get. Um, sometimes we have to look a little deeper or closer into a situation to find out what the truth of the matter really is. You may have heard me say this before, but I had a friend in high school that all the parents loved this guy. He was handsome, he had a million dollar smile and a good personality, and all the parents loved him, thought it was the greatest thing going. And all of his friends who knew him knew the monster that lurked within. And we really got a kick about, about how this guy could turn it on in front of the elder, elderly people, and, and among us, he was just a, a crazy guy at heart. Well, what we see on the outside uh, is not always what is on the inside. Now, this is certainly true of people, uh, not only like my high school friend, which he did turn out to be a pretty good guy, by the way, uh, but it may be someone you know, someone you work with, or a schoolmate, or they may appear to be a certain way, and they may appear to have it all together until a crisis comes, or until an unforeseen uh, situation comes, and they have a spontaneous reaction which is far from the person that you thought it was. The real person is exposed. The bubble is burst. And uh, you realize that they're not so together after all. They may, be, may not be so kind or gracious or considerate. And sometimes this is true of people in church. Uh, you probably have heard stories of someone that goes to church, is a member of a church, and confesses the Lord as a Savior. And, and one day, out of the blue, you, you recognize his picture in the newspaper because he's being investigated for some type of embezzlement or some type of crime that takes place. Uh, and the state has been uh, investigating him for the past three years. No one knew about it. No one would ever think that this person was, was involved in such a crime. But uh, all to say this, that you can't judge a book by its cover. Uh, what you see is not always what you get. Sometimes even churches are like this. They appear to be doing well. They have all the right things in place. Various ministries and outreaches, cross-section of people, of young, young and old people, wonderful music program and plays and so forth. They might even have Starbucks in the coffee, which I don't mind, by the way. That they may have atmospheric lighting and, and the latest in sound technology and media technology. And all the staff are stylish and fit and, and very computer savvy. And there's nothing wrong with any of those things. But often when people visit, they, they leave there saying, you know, I like it, but, but I can't put my finger on it, but there was something that just wasn't right. Something just wasn't clicking in my spirit with the whole, the whole presentation. And this reminds me of a story that I heard some years ago. Uh, you all know David Wilkerson, I think, the founder of Teen Challenge Ministries, who's now deceased. Wonderful brother in the Lord. But he tells a story when he was uh, probably, this was probably in the 80s, uh, a young Christian rock artist that was emerging had contacted David Wilkerson and asked David Wilkerson to come to a music festival where, where he was going to be uh, ministering. And now David Wilkerson does not fit into the setting of a Christian music festival to begin with, but he decided to go. And while he was there, uh, as the story goes, uh, this person was ministering and playing his songs and all this stuff. There were strobe lights and smoke machines and loud banging drums and all, everything was electric and amplified. And for David Wilkerson, he started to have visions of demons laughing at the whole situation. He said, I heard Satan's laugh at all the young people that were going crazy. The presence of God had departed. In fact, he ran around yelling the word Ichabod, 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 which comes from a story in the Old Testament, 1 Samuel chapter 4. Just quickly, Eli was a priest in Israel, had two sons. One of the sons had a wife who was pregnant. And word came to Eli that many of Israel was slaughtered his sons had died, and uh, the Ark of the Covenant was taken captive by the Philistines. Well, it says that Eli, when he heard this news, he fell off the chair he was sitting on, broke his neck, and he died. Well, when this daughter-in-law found out all this news, she went into premature labor. And she had a baby, and she named his, their baby Ichabod. 
meaning the glory of God had departed from Israel. And then, as the story goes, she died as well. That's where Ichabod comes from. But anyway, David Wilkerson is running around saying, uh, Ichabod, Ichabod, and no one paid him any attention. No one paid him any mind. It was like he wasn't even there. And so this brings us to uh, what I wanted to talk about today. And we find it in, in Revelation chapter 2, uh, starting at verse number 1. So you could turn in your Bible there, if, if you can. Um, and a little bit of history has to be said about this story. Here John is talking about, or writing to the seven churches that the Lord Jesus had revealed to him, write these letters to the seven churches. And uh, John is isolated on, on the island of Patmos, and uh, he says in chapter 2, verse 1, he says, write to the church of Ephesus. Now, in order to really get into this story, I have to tell you the background of the story. Now, this is somewhat of what we've been talking about on Wednesday nights for the past uh, couple of years. Actually, we've been talking about the church of Ephesus and now about Timothy's ministry in Ephesus. But Ephesus has a very rich history. If we were to go back, and if, if you like timelines like I do, uh, the church in Ephesus was founded in 52 A.D. Okay, so in 52 A.D., we hear in, in Acts 18 and 19, Paul went there to preach. And then he left, and a person named Apollos came, and he preached. <clears throat> he was very eloquent. He was expounding on the scriptures. He taught them. Uh, and, then, and then later Paul came back, and he preached, and preached about the baptism in the Holy Spirit. The church was filled with the Holy Spirit. They prophesied and spoke in tongues. The story goes on that in, in that church of Ephesus, there were unusual miracles, which I find interesting that it says unusual miracles because every miracle is unusual. So these must have been really unusual. And there were this, the story of the seven sons of Sceva. Do you know the story? Well, D Paul was casting out demons, and there were Jewish priests that were trying to do the same thing. They were traveling around trying to cast out demons. And this one priest, Sceva, had seven sons, and they tried to do that, and the demons actually spoke to them. And they said, we know Jesus and we know Paul, but who are you? And the great fear came upon all the people in Ephesus. And then, uh, as the story goes, um, the Christians there stopped buying the, the little statues to Diana. And there were riots in the streets. There was great commotion, great confusion in the city because Christianity had come to Ephesus, 52 AD. And then they established a school there, the school of, of Tyrannus. And the church got off to a tremendous start. So that was 52. By AD 60, Paul writes the letter to the Ephesians, the epistle to the Ephesians. 60, 62 A.D., so 10 years after it was founded, Paul sends Timothy there to be the pastor of this church. Are you with me? So now fast forward all the way to 95 A.D., so from 52 to 95, <clears throat> we have 43 years. So when it started in 52, 43 years went by, and now Jesus says to John, write this letter to the Ephesians. So the church was in existence for 43 years, when, when John writes this letter, or Jesus gives this letter for John to give to the Ephesians. Now, this is what he says. If you take your Bible and kind of read along with me here, and I'll paraphrase a little bit. He says in verse number two, I know your works, I know your labor, your patience, that you cannot bear those who are evil. You have tested those who say they are apostles and they are not, and you have found them to be liars. Now, this is a, the, the cross-reference would be when Paul left Ephesus back in 52, he said to them, when I leave, savage wolves are going to come in, so be careful. You know, protect yourself. And so now, 43 years later, Jesus is commending the church. You tested those that said they were apostles. You, 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 you found them to be liars. You, 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 you can't, you can't uh, bear with those that are uh, uh, evil. And you've done a good job in protecting the church. Verse number 3. It says, you've persevered, you persevered, and you have patience, and you've labored for my name's sake, and you've not become weary. So far, so good. He's given them a good word, a good compliment. For 43 years, you've done a good work. And then in verse number 6, it says, <clears throat> this you have, that you hate the deeds of the uh, Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Now, the Nicolaitans were, were Christian people that incorporated this doctrine 
that you could be sexually immoral and still be a Christian. And the Lord says, I, I hate that. I, that's not right. But they didn't embrace that doctrine. So they were morally pure. So they had good works and they did good labors. They weeded out the, the false prophets and so forth. And they were morally pure and holy. But in verse number four, verses four and five, we have a, a great insight into the church of Ephesus. <clears throat> Nevertheless, I have this against you that you've left your first love. So the question is, and we're going to talk about this, how could they be doing all these good things and not have their first love? And the, the premise is, you can't judge a book by its cover. What you see is not always what you get. And so the solution is, in verse number five, <clears throat> remember, uh, Jesus says to them, remember, uh, for, therefore, from where you have fallen. In other words, think about it. Think, think where you started. Think about the first things that happened when you first received the word and you first accepted Christ. Think about that. Ponder. Discover what they were and repent of those things that you're not doing and do the first works again. See that in verse number five? Do the first works again. And then it continues in verse number five. If you, you don't do these things, I'm going to take the lampstand out of your midst. And what he's saying is I'm going to take your position out of the kingdom of God. Now there were seven lampstands, one for each church, one for each letter. And if you don't do this and get this right, I'm going to remove your lampstand and remove you from the kingdom of God. Now, let's talk about this for a second. This is a church, 43 years old, functioning, looking pretty good, getting some compliments. But they lost their first love. And so the Lord says to them, repent and do those first works. Just, a, just an aside here, in 2 Corinthians uh, 7, 10 through 11, Paul gives the church some really great advice about repentance. He says there's two types of sorrow. There's godly sorrow, which, which causes repentance leading to salvation, and there's a worldly sorrow. Paraphrase, that means you feel bad because you got caught, but it leads to death. Godly sorrow will lead to life. Worldly sorrow will lead to death. But he says to the church in Corinth, look how you repented. You did it, you did it good. You had diligence. You had clearing of yourself. You, you had indignation towards sin. You had fear, vehement desire, and, and so on. And you proved yourself to be clear in all this. So when we fast forward to the church of Ephesus, the Lord is saying to the church there, listen, you've got to repent. You're doing all these wonderful things, but you lost what's most important. Repent of those things and do the first works again. Now, in, in Revelation 2.7, he concludes this statement by saying, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the, of the paradise of God. So now we're talking about something really kind of serious. Repentance in doing the first works. Now we're talking about overcoming the issues so that we don't go back and do them over and over and over again. So when I investigated the word overcoming, I found a good definition in the Full Life Study Bible, which says one who overcomes is, is one who by God's grace has re uh, received by faith, has experienced the new birth, and remains constant in its victory over sin, the world, and Satan. There's a constant awareness, a constant growth, a constant victory over sin. Now, this does not mean perfection, but it does mean we're on top of the situation. I don't know anyone who's, who's perfect in, this, in their Christian walk, but we must be aware of the fact that repentance, doing the first works, and overcoming the, the obstacles are expected by the Lord, which is one of the reasons why we have the empowerment of the Holy Spirit that we could be victorious and we can be more than overcomers. In fact, I was at a pastor's meeting this week and we we're having a discussion about sin and, and different pressures and different issues that, that pastors deal with. And one of the, one of the brothers said, to, said out loud, he said, you know, whenever I fall into something like that, I recognize the fact that that's not really me because my new nature isn't really like that. I don't dwell in my past fallen nature. Once I recognize where I'm at, I turn from that and get back into the presence and spirit of God. I thought that was really good advice. 
So our walk with God, you know, is really uh, interesting and complex. But 43 years now, this church started with a bang. 43 years later, they're, they're still functioning, but they lost their first love. Now, this has implications for our church. It, it has implications for our own walk with God. Some of you may think 43 years. I'm not even 43 years old, so you can't relate to that. Well, let me put it in perspective for you. I accepted the Lord 39 years ago when I was in my 20s. So 43 years is all not that big of a deal for me because I could, I could go back 43 years of my own life and see where I was at. But wherever you're at with the Lord, are you as on fire now as you were when you got saved? That is the question. So I've entitled the message today, First Love. And the paraphrase is up on the, on the board. You can't always judge a book by its cover. Because, you know, people may think you're on fire for God, you're good with God, things are okay. But deep down inside in your heart, you know you're not where you were when you started out in your walk. So I want to give you four areas. I think I discovered some truths about the church of Ephesus. Now, this is just, we're going to go back to Acts 18 and 19 to figure out and to see what they were like when they first got saved. So I would say for all of us here, if you could think back when you first got saved, what was going on in your life? What did you do? How did you respond? How did you act? What did you do? What did you not do to draw yourself closer to God? So I'm going to give you four things to think about and uh, several references. So we could turn back to Acts uh, 18 and 19, and we'll, we'll just refer to some scriptures as we go along. But uh, in Acts 18, 19, we see the first, the first time that the, the church in Ephesus, or the, the people of Ephesus was mentioned, that Paul went there and he began to reason uh, in the synagogue with the Jews, proclaiming the word of God. We see that then he left. We see in verses 24 to 28, a certain, uh, a certain uh, Jew named Apollos came and he began to preach to the people there in Ephesus, the word of God. Then we see in uh, Acts, uh, Acts 19, uh, verse number 2, uh, Paul is beginning to speak to them about the baptism in the Holy Spirit. We see in verses, uh, verses um, 4 and 5 that Paul was preaching about John's baptism and the baptism of Jesus. And, and the point I'm trying to make is these people obviously had an interest and a love for, guess what, for the word of God. So 43 years go by, and, and Jesus says you lost your first love. Part of what they lost was their love for the word of God. Is this relevant for us today? Listen, I could tell you countless numbers of people, when they got saved, they loved the word of God. They would read it. They would digest large portions of it at a time. They could quote it. And now 10, 20, 30 years later, they hardly ever even read their Bible. And they may be serving God in some capacity, but they lost their first love, which is the word of God. Now, the story goes on. Uh, well, before I go there, <laughs> the word of God is our basis of change, of victory, and our basis of continuing. It says in Acts chapter 2, after, the, after Pentecost had fallen, that they continued in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship. They continued in the doctrines of the church in the word of God. For me, I remember in 1977. Anyone remember 1977? Are there some, some of you? <laughs> oh, we got saved, my wife and I. We got saved. And someone, we got a Bible. And uh, I remember reading the word of God every morning. I had, I had oatmeal and Bible for breakfast every morning. And tea, hot tea. And that was, that's what I did. And I loved the word of God. I loved reading. I used to carry it with me all the time. I had a little New Testament I had. And everywhere I went, if I had 10 minutes somewhere, I'd read the word. And now, all these years, 39 years later, I'm saying, oh God, rekindle in my heart a love for your word. Not for a sermon. Not for the pastors I talk to every Tuesday. Not for Wednesday night Bible study. Not even for my family. Lord God, give me a love for your word simply for me. Simply for me. And see, I don't want to get to the place in my life where I lose my first love for the word of God. 
The word of God to me is, is poetic, it's deep. Sometimes it's a little bit, not comical, but it could be comical. It could be very serious. It's got drama in it. It's got insight in it. But when I read the word of God, something happens to my spirit and to my soul and to my mind. And I become, I become cleaner and I become purified. I become more in line with the spirit of the living God. So we, the first thing we have to, and I'm, I'm presenting to you today is, if you want your first love, you've got to rekindle your fervor and your desire for the word of God. Psalm 119, 105, you, you, you all know this. <clears throat> it's still true. The word of God is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. You don't know which way to live, how to live your life, what to do. Get into the word of God. The word of God will show you how to live your life. Hebrews 4.12 says, thy, thy word is living and active and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces through soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's the living word of God. So I can almost see, you know what, if someone's lukewarm, they may not even be interested in the word of God because it's too convicting. But if we want to stay on track and, and rekindle that first love, we've got to get into the word of God. Psalm 119.11 says, Thy word I have hid in my heart that I may not sin against you. So number one, I, I, I believe this is the most uh, important thing from Revelations 2.4. What they lost was their love for the word of God, which affected everything else. Now they did everything. They had ministries going on. They were effective to a degree, but they lost something in their soul. I believe it was their love for the word because their love for the word was the first thing that's demonstrated in Acts 18 and 19. The second thing that they, I believe that they lost, we find it in Acts 19, verses 11 and 12. And this, is, this was their, their desire for the supernatural. And let me, let me explain that. When, I got, when Pamela and I got saved, <clears throat> no one talked about healings and deliverances and casting out demons. No one ever talked. I never knew about all that stuff. All I knew was something supernatural must have happened to me because I was different. That's what I knew. And Pamela knew it too because she saw it close up. And some of my friends, my family, they knew something happened to, little, to, to Rick Amendola. Something happened to me that, that, that was that he couldn't learn at school or couldn't learn from a job. Something happened from outside coming in and changed his life. That was a very supernatural experience for me. It's almost like a, a rocket ship took off. You ever see a rocket and it blasts off in the outer space? That initial boost or thrust, I, I'm still going 39 years later on what happened to me in 1977. I got saved. I got saved. This is a supernatural work of God. So I think that when, they, when, they, when, when Jesus says you lost your first love, they lost their love for the word. I also think they lost their desire for the super. They forgot where they came from. All right? Because in Acts 19, uh, uh, 11 and 12, it says that, that Paul worked unusual miracles. It says that he would take handkerchiefs or aprons and, and I guess pray over them and people would take them and, and, and put them on people and these people would get healed physically and demons would flee. But see, the supernatural was very much a part of their lives. And now, now, when I got saved, I didn't, know, I didn't know anything about the Pentecostal church. All I knew was that God was real and I was a changed person. When I started to attend a Assembly of God church, I began to realize, oh, people do pray for the sick, and people do expect God to do things, and oh, I guess that's part of the package, I, and it all made sense to me. So the supernatural must be a part of what we're all about. Otherwise, we're just going to be a lukewarm church like a lot of other churches that are liberal in their doctrine, don't really believe the Word of God, but they are a church, and they do really good works in town. In fact, we have some of that in Haverhill. We have some churches in town that do great works with the poor, with the clothing and food and different things, but they never preach the word of God, but they do good works. We cannot allow that to happen to us, and we cannot allow that to happen to us individually nor collectively. So we need to have a desire for the supernatural. 
uh, Mark 16, Jesus, Jesus said this. Signs and wonders will follow the preaching of the word. He said that. You'll heal the sick. He said you'll speak in new tongues. Jesus said that. He said if, if you get bitten by a snake or whatever I call it, if you have, if you have a, a, any trouble, you're divinely protected. And if you lay hands on the sick, they'll be healed. Fast forward to Acts chapter 8, when Philip left Jerusalem because of the persecution, went to Samaria. What do you think happened in Samaria? People were getting saved. People were getting healed. Demons were being cast out. It was the normal experience of the church. So I put all that together and say, you know what? I don't want to be like the church of Ephesus in that regard. I want to do all the good works that they're talking about and maintain our first love, which is a love for the word of God and a real desire and, and, and acceptance of the supernatural moving in our midst. Amen? So listen, this is really important. The question, I, I was asked this question recently, probably two or three weeks ago. Someone, a, a minister came up to me and said to me, uh, he was kind of like shy. He said, uh, does the Assembly of God still believe in the supernatural? I said, yeah, why do you say that? He goes, I've been to a lot of Assembly of God churches and nothing's happening. I said, what do you mean nothing's happening? Well, there's no gifts, there's no tongues, there's interpretation, there's no emphasis on healing, there's nothing happening. I said, well, we believe in the supernatural in this Assembly of God church. So I think there's, a, there's somewhat of a, I don't know, a, a movement or something to be, to be, forgive me for saying this, but to be more respectable, more dignified, more, I don't know, self-righteous maybe. But when I think of a church, I really do think of a spiritual hospital, and I really think that it, it, it sometimes it gets messy because God is dealing with people's lives. We need to accept this supernatural thing that God allows to happen. And, and not think we're better than all that, and we, we can't allow that to happen. Man, I'd rather have wildfire than no fire. Amen? So, so we, what, we, what do we need? We need you know, prayer emphasis. We, have, we need tarrying around the altars. We need a higher expectation that God is able. We need to give God time to move among us. We, we believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 12. We believe all that. We believe in the grace gifts from Romans 12. Spent weeks talking about that earlier this year. We believe in the gifts that Jesus gave to the church, the apostles and pastors and teachers, evangelists, uh, prophets. We believe all that. It's all God's business. So we need the supernatural. This reminds me of a story back in our old church in Webster, Mass. Probably about 10 or 12 years ago. I got a phone call. And uh, this member of the church asked me if I'd come visit a person that he was, that he was visiting <clears throat> who was having trouble. So pastors get those calls every now and then. So I said, yeah, I'll meet you there, you know, around 536. This person was a policeman in town, having all sorts of marital trouble, trouble on the job, trouble with God, mad at everybody. And I came in there, and I didn't know, I didn't know all that until I got there, I found out. So I started to t you know, tell him about the love of Christ, the love of Jesus quoted some scriptures, tried to explain things to him. This guy was sitting in the chair. He, he recoiled himself and started hissing at me, like, Sss. and I gave him, give me the evil eye. I thought, okay, Lord. <laughs> and then I was, I was, I was happy. The, the people that asked me were Christian people. They began to pray. I knew they began to pray. And I, I kept on talking. I kept on talking about the Lord and the supernatural power of God to change a life. He's like, Tsss. and all of a sudden, after a little while, he began to soften. And, and, I, and I, I finally got to the point where I said, listen, do you want to, and we rebuked the demon, we re rebuked whatever it was. And I said to him, do you want to receive Jesus into your life? He said, yeah, I really do. So I'm saying to myself, I don't know where this man is at, but we'll go ahead and we'll lead him to the Lord. Let the Lord deal with him. So he said the sinner's prayer. All good. I prayed, said goodbye. I went home. This was 6 o'clock at night. Before I left, I said, listen, meet me at the church at 8 o'clock in the morning. I was testing him. I didn't think he'd get up early to meet me at 8 o'clock in the morning. I'm never there at 8 o'clock. I'm always there at 9 o'clock. But I figured I'll be there at 8 o'clock just to see if he gets there at 8 o'clock. 
I get there at 8 o'clock. He's sitting on the steps waiting for me. Clear-eyed, clear mind, bright and bushy-tailed, ready to talk to the pastor. So we go in there, we talk, and he's happy, he's giggling, he's excited about God. This brother eventually became a church member, eventually became a board member. This policeman, and about three years after that, was chosen to be the police chief of Webster, Mass., and still is to this day serving the Lord. So don't tell me the supernatural doesn't work. The supernatural works today. And we have to be a church that brings the supernatural to the world around us. Amen? Let me give you number three real quick. I'm looking at the clock. The, first, the third thing that I, I think that the people there lost was this, was this uh, attitude or disposition or living out of, of purity in their lives. Well, let me explain what I mean. In, Acts, in Revelation 2, Six, it says that they hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. So they, they were morally, uh, they were sexually and morally pure in that regard. But it also says in, in Acts 19, if, if you want to go there, verses 18 and 19, it says that um, many who believed came confessing and telling their deeds. And verse 19 says they sold their books, their magic books, their sorcery and witchcraft books. They, they burned it all up. And what I'm trying to get at is they were, they were, if I could be more specific, they were sexually pure. That wasn't the issue in this church. Other churches it was. This church was sexually pure, but they, they, were, they lost their purity and how they lived their lives. In other words, in the beginning, they were crystal clear. They were an open book. They confessed. They gave testimony. They burned what they didn't, what they didn't, what they knew wasn't right. They got rid of it. They were publicly proclaiming the victory in Christ. I could just picture 43 years fast forward. Now they're kind of prim and proper. They're doing all the right things in their church, and no one knows where they came from, and they don't want to tell anybody. Now they're a closed book. They're sexually moral. That, they got that down. But everything else in their life is a big secret. No one knows what God has done for them. So, for us, we may not be a drug addict anymore. We may not use foul language anymore. We might not be in the porn anymore or whatever. Uh, we, we, might, uh, we might be good, outstanding citizens, but you know what? Nobody knows where we're coming from. We just blend in like the rest of the society. And what I'm saying is a call to purity is a call to be radical. In this life today, and I'm not only talking about sexuality. That, that's a whole other discussion. That, that is true. But I'm talking about other areas of our lives where we don't cheat, we don't steal, we don't lie, we don't do things that are contrary to the word of God. We stand out as being people of integrity and honor. We're distinct in that way. And so this is what I mean. I think they lost some of that purity, some of that desire to be out there living their lives in the public eye. Because it says in Acts 19 that all the people were amazed that they were now serving God and burning their books. Their testimony was ringing out through all the community. And now I, I see 43 years later, they're kind of just like, they're good old church people. They go to church, they're doing their thing, they come and they go, and no one knows anything anymore. But I'm saying I never want my Christian life to be like that. I want my Christian life to be as on fire as when I first got saved. When I first got saved, I didn't burn witchcraft books, but I got rid of all my albums, all my rock albums, all the stuff I had. I got rid of stuff in my house that I was just excess baggage. I threw it away. So what are we going to do now? Just accumulate stuff? To have stuff? I want to be as radical now and later as I was when I first came to Christ. And my wife said, amen. She remembers the day I got rid of all those albums. You know my story, right? Down in North Carolina, they have dumpsters, big dumpsters. I got all my albums, you know? Beatles, Allman Brothers, I don't know who. Uh, I can't even think. Led Zeppelin. And I, and I made them like, like Frisbees and got them and boom, threw them into the dumpster. Took me an hour to get rid of, just got rid of them all. It was excess baggage. But in any case, I want to be as on fire and as pure now as I was then. So James 4.8 says, draw near to God, he will draw near to you. 
Listen, if you've been serving the Lord for 20 years, draw near to God. Don't coast. If you've been serving the Lord for 30 years, draw near to God. You haven't arrived yet, my friend. Draw near to God. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. First love. They lost their first love. I think they lost this purity of their soul. Philippians 4.8 says, whatever things are pure, meditate on these things. 1 Timothy 5.22, Paul writes, Timothy, keep yourself pure in context of your dealings with people. Don't get aggravated. Don't get mad. Don't get angry. Don't be condescending. Keep yourself pure in your relationships with people. James 3.17 says, the wisdom that's from above is first pure. Then it's peaceable and gentle and willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits. 1 John 3.3 3 says, if you have the hope of Christ's return in your heart, you'll purify yourself as he is pure. So I just want to say, like, we want to get back to our first love. We may be sexually pure. That's good. But all the other areas of our life are not so clean. And we're picking up the ways of the world. No one ever knows because we never say anything. And the church is functioning, but the vessels are dirty. The fourth one is this, and I'm going to go quick here. The fourth one is this. They were definitely a public witness. I remember when I first got saved, you know, my friend Lenny, right? Everyone knows my friend Lenny. Now he's in heaven. But Lenny said, he kept telling me, go tell someone about your salvation. I kept on thinking, why do I have to tell anybody? This is between me and God. Well, later on I realized, you know, confession of the mouth is important. But when these people got saved in Ephesus, they, they changed the economy because no one bought the statues for Diana anymore. And Demetrius and all these people were very upset. And, he, and they even said, look, they're not buying our statues anymore. We're going out of business. And he said, the whole religious community is in uproar because no one's worshiping Diana anymore. So they did two things. They affected the economy, and they affected the religious culture in which they lived. I call that a public witness to affect the community where we live. So, so I, think, I think 43 years later, they lost that. They became respectable. They became normal. They became just like everybody else. But they had faith, but they were no longer out there. I think the Lord is calling us to be out there. Sometimes we need to be politically incorrect. Sometimes we need to stand up and stand out in our convictions. Sometimes, as Jesus said, we need to be light and salt to the world around us. He said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. He also said to be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. In other words, don't be crazy about it, but be wise what you do. But be a good witness for me in the public, in the public square. So <clears throat> I've been thinking about this for, for years now. What was it that they lost? I think looking back to the history of the church in Ephesus, these are four areas that I think they really lost. But I think it's true for all of us. And we could probably go through every letter in Revelation, those seven letters, go through each one and pick out certain things for the different churches and apply them to us. So this, this message is for our church, but it's also for every individual in the church. Where are we with the Lord? Where are you with the Lord? If we want to renew our first love and get that fire back into our hearts, we've got to love the word of God. We've got to expect the supernatural, not be afraid of it. And we've got we've to pursue a pure life, you know, morally. And we've got to be aware of the fact that we're called to be a public witness. And that is the word of the Lord that God put on my heart today. Let's stand together, can we?